Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or seeking to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as clinical psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Welcome back. Richard, we just had a fantastic interview with Dr. Jamie Madigan. I have to say, that was uh, that was a, an hour well spent. Yeah. You know, yeah. learned a lot, got teased a lot <laughs> by you two young whippersnappers. And you introduced it. But I asked it. for it. You did. I didn't, yeah. No, I didn't ask for it. But Well, you can't whisper. <laughs> I remember. No, it. put it in context. So he said, he, he, he said, said, I can remember a time before... Um, cable TV, but he, he oh, was saying I know he can't really remember a time before video games. Right, because he was saying that he grew up with video games. Right. You know, he said, I can never remember a time that I didn't have a video game. Right. I started when I was young. And he said, I can remember a time when I didn't have internet. I can remember a time when I didn't have cell phone. And cable TV. And cable TV. But he said, I can't remember a time when I didn't have... And when he said cable TV, I said... I can remember when we didn't have TV. And he said, I can remember when we didn't have black and white TV. And I said, I raise you and call you because I can remember time when there were, I, I remember when I was young, we did not have a TV in our house. Yeah. And they hadn't, you had a radio. it was invented. I had a little one. Hey, let's all sit around and listen to the radio. <laughs> what did we listen to? Boxing matches. But I can remember a time, no, I can remember TV was invented because we had relatives who had little funny looking TV. Speaking of boxing match, this podcast is going to post on um, on the 26th. You know what's tonight? The night of the 26th. The boxing match between Mayweather and Conor McGregor. Is it really? That's the big match tonight. Yeah. What's your prediction? My son wants Conor McGregor to win. He does? Yeah. Why? He doesn't like Mayweather. Oh. I don't know why. Um, this has been the most interesting guys. artfully marketed contest. That I, it's like a Super Bowl. It, yeah, it has been masterfully marketed. I used to think that what now that we're on this topic, um, I oh, used to right. think that the, the whole thing between um, Mayfield and Tyson and Tyson and um, George uh, Foreman and mm-hmm. you know when when all those guys. I remember. All the hype about those matches. Right. Um, that you don't was remember huge. Muhammad Ali? No. Oh, no. Talk about hype. I, but I remember that, and I th- remember thinking, these guys are just going to go fight each other. You know, what's the big deal? This Mayweather and um, mm-hmm. and, and McGregor. This is this is crazy. There's huge, there's yeah. new videos coming out every day. Right. Uh, this is them. a huge deal. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. So that that that, that has anything to do with has this. nothing to do with video <laughs> games unless they make one of the match a fight. I guess it's it, called unless we want to talk about uh, Mike Tyson's Punch Out or or Nintendo's Punch Out, which was a great video game for the NES system. Uh, that was a great. Oh, um, that was a vid- you're talking about a video game. Yeah, that was a video game. See, it's like you slip into a foreign language when yeah. you talk about. Would you call that scrolling games? Mm-hmm. See, that's foreign language. Anyway. Um, we did an interview this morning. Yes. With... So it was Dr. Jamie Madigan, and he, he he's an I.O. psychologist, which means that he doesn't do clinical work. He doesn't right. do, you know, he's not, he doesn't do therapy and those kinds of things, but he works with systems and, and organizations and companies mm-hmm. to, um, to really help optimize performance right. and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we were saying, as we kind of, before we got off on our tangent, we are talking about how he has always played video games and he bridges uh, psychology and video games in right. a very nice and interesting way. And he, he started a blog, he said in 2009, so it's about eight years eight old, years, right. uh, he started a, a website called psychologyofgames.com right. mm-hmm. where he posts really Natural interesting long-term. articles yeah. and he really insightful um, and, and you right. know, research supported blog posts um, and he talks about video games. Right. Um, and this, what I like about him, first of all, he's well trained, of course. Yeah, he's yeah. got a PhD and, and um, serious, and knows how to do research and is, mm-hmm. is a, is a well trained psychologist. Um, but he's also a gamer. Yeah. And, and that's why we brought up this early, earlier, we right. brought up about he's only known video games. What I, what I, as 
one who doesn't know much about video games appreciate is that he's not afraid of them. Um, he doesn't see it as the right. devil. He doesn't see it as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's helpful to get his perspective because there are important clinical issues right. like addiction and time management and how much right. and what kind of games should kids be playing yeah. and are they related to violence. So there's a, there are a number of important socio political mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and clinical questions yeah. related to this. And this is a person who um, is, is, I don't like the word comfortable, but he's comfortable with video games. Yeah. He's not afraid of them. Mm -hmm. And so he can speak to the issue in an objective, I think a more objective way, because yeah. he doesn't bring a bias. Many of us bring a bias right. to video games. Um, he doesn't. Right. And he talks quite a bit, and he, and, he, and he uses the research that's mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's he's, really great. And this is very impressive. This part right here. That's where, yeah. Wow. He he has consulted, <clears throat> done right. interviews with, and, and talked to all kinds of people about this topic, including mm -hmm. you know the Washington Post, Wired, uh, the, the Chicago Atlantic. Tribune, BBC, uh, Oprah Magazine. Yeah. Um, I mean everything from the Atlantic, but and... also PlayStation Magazine, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. um, you know right. the game ecological, gameological <laughs> right. uh, society. So. He, He's, right. He knows his stuff. <clears throat> right. He's he's really, this is an impressive guy. Um, if you have any interest in this at all, and, and if you have kids, you mm -hmm. especially boys, you probably do. Right. And, and this would be a good source. And, and so check out his website. You'll find links yeah. to him on social media and everything. But you'll also find a link to his book. Right. He published in 2015 through uh, Roman... And, and Littlefield mm -hmm. uh, called Getting Gamers, right. and it is a uh, it is a thorough book that right. talks about. Uh, it has chapters on violence in video games. It has yeah. chapters on um, just yeah. about everything that you want to know about psychology of video games. This would be an easy book to recommend, right? Um, because he's done his research. Um, mm -hmm. It's not it's not just criticism. Um, he's gone into the literature. He's gone into the research. Right. And if you're looking for one book to answer is. a lot of these questions, this is the one I would rely on. Absolutely. We're probably going to put it in our office somewhere, yeah. you know, just so parents can leaf through it while they're waiting to right. see us. Um, this is, a, I think it's a good book to keep on hand. Yeah, absolutely. So, so. But enjoyable morning uh, yeah. with this guy. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I think you'll learn And I think we're going to have him come back. He's yeah. doing uh, some work on addiction, yeah. uh, video game and addiction. So uh, we, we invited him to come back and talk about that, and yep. he's agreed. So we'll hear more from uh, Dr. Madigan. Yep, absolutely. So, so. We Thank hope you. you in, um, yeah, yeah, hope you enjoy it. So enjoy the podcast. Well, great, great. And, and where are you located? I, I, for some reason, I was thinking you were here on the East Coast, but um, you're Central Time. St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Oh. Oh, right. you're right in the pet. You're going to be able to see the, um, the, the eclipse. eclipse. You're yeah. right under it. Yeah, we'll get the total, the totality, or it's, it's totally blocked out. We're right. I blocked off time tomorrow afternoon and everything to, to go check that out. Do you, have your glass. Do you have your glasses? I do. Amazon. I bought some from Amazon. Then they sent out that recall notice saying like, hey, these may make you go blind if you use them. <laughs> so don't. Yeah, we were going <laughs> to issue that warning ourselves. You know, be careful, Jamie. Yeah. We want you to come back fully, fully sighted on Tuesday. Yeah. So uh, we went out and got some other ones that are uh, totally certified. And I went out and tested them. And I was able to look directly at the sun <laughs> oh, without wow. uh, any pain or anything. So. Okay. Well, you good. can still see today, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, well, great. Well, um, all right. Well, you know, and, and I, I found your website and there is just so much information on your website. Um, but, you know, kind of getting into to some of this, we we're, we're doing a whole week on um, of podcasts on on video gaming. And uh, when I came across your website, I was like, man, we really got to talk to this guy because it looks like you're really putting a lot of this information together. Um, yeah. are, are you doing research in the area or is it, is it an area that you're, you're just um, sort of interested in clinically? Tell me, tell me a little bit about what you do with it. Yeah, so I don't, I don't do research because that's hard. That's yeah. true. <laughs> <I leave> it, <laughs> we so, understand. <laughs> yeah, I leave that to more qualified people, though. I mean, I am trained as a, as a psychologist. I have a PhD in psychology. My uh, area of training and, and what I do in my day job is uh, industrial organizational psychology. Oh. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's yeah. psychology of the workplace. 
Yeah. So it's it's applying psychology to understanding and predicting behavior in the workplace and making employees better, you know, happier and more productive and, and workplaces better. Um, so that is what I do during the day. I'm a, a consultant in that field. <clears throat> and uh, so I don't do research. I see my sort of role as like reporting on and trying to share what psychology has to say about video games with the, you know, the people who make games, sell games, play games. Excellent. Those are Excellent. Three, main three audiences. That's great. Um, so, so you, and I did see that too on your, on your, in your bio that, you know, you've, it looks like you've consulted with a lot of such groups uh, and creators uh, in, in that sense. Yeah, I find that a lot of game developers find their way, you know, to my site and, and like to make use of the stuff that I have on there. So I've done some lectures, I've done some, you know, one-off consulting projects with a few different companies where I'll just come in and give a lecture or talk to them about their game and give them some ideas and say what the, what the uh, literature has to say about some of the design questions that they're wrestling with. Um, not a whole lot of that, but occasionally, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, we, we we've had the opportunity on the here on the podcast to talk to psychologists who specialize in a, a lot of different areas and me mental health professionals that specialize in a lot of different areas. And we we recently spoke with with a woman who is doing some teaching and just wrote a book mm -hmm. on the psychology of superheroes. Uh, yeah. So so you know it's it's I think it's fascinating and, and wonderful that. Our, our field is sort of branching out into these other areas because it's, you know, there's so much psychology in video games uh, yeah. and, and what video, what people say about video games and how we interact with video games that it's, it's great that, you know, people are really looking at that. Yeah. And I, I haven't really delved into the whole section of psychology dealing with mental health. Like you guys probably have like, so I don't consider myself an expert on mental health issues. Um, psychology is a huge field, like you said, and I deal a lot with you know things around like decision making and emotions and ways that people perceive and make use of information and and all that sort of stuff. Which you're you're right, it does overlap frequently with good game design and just sort of the way that people behave when they're playing video games and and how that changes. And a lot of social psychology because games are very social experiences and everything that social psychology has to say about the way that people interact, you know, just face to face in meet space also can often be applied to how they interact online or through computer, you know, uh, technology mediated experiences. So there's a, it's a lot of stuff. Psychology is a big field and there's a lot of ways to apply it. So I'm glad you guys are, are doing this as well. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, Tell us, how, what did you get interested in and start with gaming in general? And, and how did you start to think about branching into that area uh, yeah. from, from a psychological perspective? I mean, I, I'm one of those people that has played games their whole life. So, you know, I was I was an arcade rat, uh, <laughs> meaning like the coin operated kind back in, you know, when I was a kid in the 80s. And I practically lived at the Aladdin's castle down the road from my house <clears throat> where I grew up. I played a lot of those and, you know, my first gaming console was the Atari 2600 and a friend of mine had the ColecoVision. So I uh, played a lot of those. And then it was just, it was just a habit that I never grew out of. Uh, one of those things, you know, I stuck with it uh, for the rest of my life and moved into PC gaming and uh, modern era of console gaming and uh, still play today. And then, I started the psychologyofgames.com website back in like late 2009. Jeez, it has wow. been that long. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do something special for the 10 year anniversary. But mm -hmm. I uh, started that back in late 2009 when I was kind of looking for a new blogging project. So I'd always kind of liked doing, you know, just writing and, ju and writing blog posts and having a website and had done some stuff uh, previously around like book reviews and hey here's pictures of my kid that like five people in the world are interested in seeing and but I liked it so I was looking for a new topic and I had been reading a lot of psychology books about um, well books about behavioral economics which if you're mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that it's the psychology of decision making essentially yeah. applied to everyday decisions and circumstances 
and have been reading a lot of those types of books and found them really applicable and thought, man, somebody should really write about the psychology of video games and how about all this stuff applies to video games. And I thought, well, I'm somebody, so I've got a computer. And so I threw a website together and, you know, registered the domain and threw up a few articles and uh, it just kind of started taking off. And like I said, game developers especially found their way to it as well as the wider audience and it took off and then um, just kept doing it and did start doing a podcast a couple of years ago and wrote the book and and all that sort of stuff so it, it's it's fun i think i'll i'll keep on with it okay hey jamie i have a question you have a child right i have a couple how old uh 13 and 10. do they play video games all the time <laughs> okay so my third question is um how much time do they spend playing video games do you monitor it uh loosely yeah i mean we don't have like timers or anything right. like that um because they're generally pretty good about it and a lot of the time especially my older daughter a lot of the time that she spends playing games she does it with a friend um uh -huh. so she'll either be playing a multiplayer game or she'll have uh like an ipad with facetime and her friend mm -hmm. up on it and they'll just be interacting while they play even totally different separate games they're not actually playing together but they're they're socializing together um, or she's playing with me or you know something like that so i don't tend to worry about the time spent as much if they're interacting with another person and doing some sort of cooperative or uh, interactive uh, play would um, you worry if it was a solitary activity not so much i mean if it started to interfere with her schoolwork or you know she said i don't want to play soccer anymore because i want more time to play games Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to be on swim team anymore. You know, if it started to interfere with other activities and so forth. Uh, but it generally hasn't because, you know, we make them do those types of things and right. make them do their homework and, and so forth. And I don't care that they play video games instead of sitting in front of a TV, for example. In right. fact, right. I can identify more with the games that they're playing than the shows that they would probably watch. So. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's mm -hmm. great. We, we, one of the podcasts we, we did for this week was uh, we talked about what we're just referred to as the 168 hour solution. And yeah. we talk about, you know, there's only 168 hours in a week. And so when you're thinking about how much time your child is spending playing video games, what you really need to be thinking about um, is the other obligations for the remaining 180, 168 hours, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that they, as you were saying, that your child yeah. is, you know, engage in some other activities that, that, you know, all of their time isn't spent on video games. Yeah. yeah and that's generally the, the attitude that my wife and I take and it's worked out well so far. Jamie, I have another question uh, since you do consult in this area. I'm not a game. I, I'm too old. Uh, I missed. The you're never too old. You're, you know, that, that's just an excuse, but go um, ahead. I, I get where you're going. <laughs> That's not an excuse. I missed the whole thing. For me, it's a foreign language that video games. Um, but the the uh, it seems to me that the objective of game designers is to make the games as compelling as possible. I, I don't use the word addictive as possible, but as compelling as possible, so that you keep playing. Um, is is that is that an accurate statement? First of all, it's one of the objectives. Yeah. Does that bother you at all? No. I mean, you find that in all areas of art, right? I mean, TV producers want you to keep watching. TV, certainly, them. yeah. They want to get you back. Mm -hmm. Sports want you to keep tuning in or watching or going to games. Um, I, I find that seems like it would show up anywhere in different areas of entertainment, you know. And the reason I ask is because many of the parents that we see who are concerned about their children's gaming always ask that question, you know, that my child is addicted to, and then cell phone and video games and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? Do you advise parents or schools or anybody about that kind of thinking? No, I mean, I, I haven't advised or consulted in any professional sense, but whenever somebody asks me about that, we kind of go back to what we were talking about before. It's like, how is this fitting in with the rest of your child or, right. or your or my life you know mm -hmm. if it's becoming a problem if it's interfering with other activities if it's help if it's preventing you from reaching your goals you know whether that's to do well in school or do well at work or you know 
pursue this other hobby as well, then it it's becoming a problem. Right. Um, otherwise, you know, I think it's fun to have fun. Um, right. But there's nothing unique. There's nothing unique about a video game compared to any of these other activities. Right. I, well, no. I mean, I think video games are unique relative to other types of media, uh, mostly because of how interactive they are and how social they are. Um, reading and you know playing a game is different from watching television or re or watching a movie or reading a book because you're co-authoring that experience, right? So the player is making decisions and doing things that define what that experience is going to be, much more so relative to an author writing a book or you know a director making a movie or, or whatever. So a lot of the research has shown that you know it is a different experience and it elicits sort of different emotions and different involvement and it can be much more engaging um, than those other types of things. Um, so I wouldn't say that they're the same exactly, but they are, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't have anywhere else to go with that thought. I wouldn't say they're the same exactly, but a lot of the same rules apply in terms of managing your time and managing how uh, dedicated you are to that and how much you let it interfere with other things. Right. Yeah. And, and we've talked about that, that, you know, like any, like a lot of these other things, you know, if you're, if you, if you're neglecting other obligations, because you want to finish reading a book that could be just as problematic as neglecting other obligations because you want to play video games. You know, it, it's, it, it's the things that you're obligations that you're not meeting to do any of these other activities that is more problematic than uh, actually what the activity is. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, video, there seems to be these two camps, with uh, as it relates to video games the the camp that says you know video games you know are are great and i certainly want to ask you um i, I see your uh creeper um uh, uh figurine in the back um so I, I certainly want to talk to you about some educational things perhaps uh, or some positive things with video games but you know video games tend to get a, a really bad rap sometimes when it comes to um, whether it's violence or, you know, everybody's on the, the desensitization and, you know, just, and, and I think that that really started mm -hmm. in, in maybe in 99 was really the first time I heard it, you know, after Columbine, you know, they were really going on about how Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold, you know, they played Doom and, and, you know, they play these violent video games and listen to violent music and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, did, has a re have you seen any other research, because I, I don't know that I have, any research that really uh, strongly substantiates the idea that video games can incite violence in, in, um, in players, gamers? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is no. Um, and that that is one of the most common questions that, that comes up when people find out what I write about and, and talk about the whole psychology of games thing. Um, but the research on the link between violence and video games, I don't think is at the point where we can say anything about the, the, that idea that they incite or that they cause or, or playing violent games leads to violent behavior. And a lot of that has to do with the fact, and, what, and this is a long history, right? I mean, violence in games really got its start during like the early to mid 1990s with the whole Mortal Kombat and the congressional hearings and right, that's true. and then after that, the industry, you know, uh, volunteered to create the ESRB rating system uh, to try to take more control of the issue itself. But there was like, all, you know, all of those hearings and politicians involved with trying to grandstand and say, like, these things are leading to the, you know, corruption of youth and the destruction of America, which is a moral panic that goes back you know, centuries, right? I mean, we saw it with comic books and rock and roll music and you go back far enough and people were saying crossword puzzles are gonna, are ruining the minds of America's youth and uh, and women are just staying home to do the crossword puzzle instead of, you know, performing their duty and chess is corrupting young males throughout the nation because it leads to, le you know, a life of leisure and, and inactivity. And, you know, you can keep going back and finding that and go back to like ancient Greeks and they were uh, against reading, right? Instead right. of memorizing texts and all this sort of stuff. But to circle back and, and bring it back to modern times and the thing that you originally asked about, 
Um, the research on linking violent behavior to violent games is really difficult to do uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, which is probably the main reason that, or one of the reasons why we haven't seen any links. The other great big reason is that there's no link there to be seen, but it's difficult to take um, people and do a clinical study where you would expose some of them to violent games and then measure actual violent behavior as a result. And you certainly can't do that sort of thing with children, right? Which is what the group that most people are concerned about, right? Mm -hmm. You can't have a group, take a group of children and have them play a super violent game. You know, no university is going, you know, review board is going to give you permission to do that study. Uh, nobody's going to want their child to participate in that study. Um, but really one of the main problems and that I've, I've talked to actual experts and people who actually have done research, you know, I've done podcasts uh, on this episode of the podcast on this whole question. And, and there's a chapter in the book about it. Um, the idea of what is like violent behavior is really difficult to pin down. And a lot of the research, when you go and look at it, there are examples of violent behavior caused by playing violent games is stuff that we don't normally think of as as violent behavior or even aggression, right? So it's things like we got them to blast somebody else with some unpleasant sound, or we got them to add additional hot sauce to another person's food when they were preparing it, or we gave them some word completion exercises uh, where they, uh, you know, they would have like a word with a missing letter, and they were asked to fill in a letter to make a word and more often they made a word that sort of sounded violent, like bomb or shoot uh, or something like that, instead of nonviolent uh, words that they could have come up with. So the argument would go that that makes them, that, that means that they have violence on the mind, like on the tip of their mind, they're thinking violent thoughts because they were more easily or more quickly came up with violent words uh, when they could have come up with any kind of word. And that's not typical what we think of as violent behavior or aggression, right? That's not what a normal person would think of. And then there's just the fact that behavior in the real world has multiple causes, right? And there, there are forces working against um, violent behavior in the world. Like you're not going to get in a fight because you might worry that you get your butt kicked or you might worry that you'd get in trouble, right? You know, if you're a kid, you don't want to get... Uh, you certainly don't want to get trashed by, you know, the person you're picking a fight with and you don't want to get in trouble with the teachers or your parents. If you're an adult, you don't want to get in trouble with the law. Um, so there are all kinds of things that even if games had a very small effect uh, or other types of violent media like movie, you know, we saw this whole argument put forth with television and movies and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, even if that did have some sort of effect, like the rest of the world is pushing back against that that effect and it's not going to amount to enough in the real world to get somebody uh, to engage in the types of behaviors that everybody is worried about. Yeah. Well, I remember in uh, a little bit after uh, Columbine, I, I was working at the University of South Florida in the uh, Department of Psychiatry and we had a, they had an invited lecturer come in and, and talk um, about video games and, and violence and everything. And he, he, he made one of the a, a statement that has really stuck with me. He, he says, you know, um, video games would likely have no more effect than, than any television program or movie or anything like that. And he said, and if you think about it, you know, we didn't create a link. People didn't watch, you know, the old Westerns and start robbing banks and <laughs> robbing trains and stage cars and stuff like that. You know, why would we think that playing some of these games is going to have a, a similar effect? And I think that, you know, I, you know, sort of your earlier point, which I think is a, a fantastic point, that the, the intimacy of the interaction in video games is very different than watching a, a, a video. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, you're, you're right in that the, the ability to create this causal link between mm -hmm. a, a video game and a, a violent act mm -hmm. is, is, would be really difficult to research no matter what, I mean, how do you, how do you do that? I, I can't even think of a research design yeah. that could do that. Yeah, and you know, violent behavior is such a kind of a what we call a low base rate problem, in that it, in other words, it's so rare that it's difficult to get the numbers you need to to you know statistically link those two types of things. Right, and and the 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 issue of um, you know 
for lack of a better phrase, chicken or the egg. You know, right. one of the things that, that, that I, we've talked about before is that, you know, people who have violent tendencies are attracted to violent games. And so just because a person plays a, 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 an aggressive game or a violent game or a game with shooting and, and, and those kinds of things, doesn't necessarily mean that those tendencies or, or, or propensities weren't already there um, because they're wanting to be stimulated in much the same way as other people who played those kinds mm -hmm. of games want to be stimulated. Yeah, that's why a lot of the research that just looks at survey-based data where they say, how how many problems have you had with you know getting in trouble over violent behavior versus how much video games do you play, would you say, in a week? That sort of correlational data, you're right, it doesn't lead anywhere because there's still the the confound, the alternative explanation that, well, that's just the kind of person who likes violence. And so, of course, they're going to consume violent media in, in all forms. Right. right. Um, and, you know, another one of the counter arguments to violent games cause violent behavior is often that, well, because video games are getting so much more popular and so many more people are playing them, then if that link were there, then you would expect crime rates to go up. And in, case, and in fact, crime rates have gone down in the United States mm -hmm. historically, like they're at an all time low for, for violent crimes. Uh, across across the entire nation and when you look at the big picture um, and then in fact there was some interesting research that looked at like the release date for incredibly popular incredibly violent games like grand theft auto 5 for example and they actually looked at um you know police reports and other sources of crime statistics and found that you know in the days following the release of a of a big profile game like that crime went down actually and sort of the popular opinion is that it's the midnight basketball effect, right? That the nor people normally committing crimes, young men mostly, right, are not out on the streets. They're inside playing Grand Theft Auto V instead of whatever hooliganism they might have been up to. That's right. And, right. And that happens true. enough to actually cause a visible effect in, in the crime stats. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I, I didn't see those stats. That's, that's fantastic. Um, now, one of the other sides is is mm -hmm. using video games and stuff with with learning um for educational and, purposes yeah right and mm -hmm. and i think that you know again i mentioned the um i, I think that's a creeper there behind you um yeah. the yeah. the idea of those kinds of games that really can um you know sort of foster creativity um, three-dimensional thinking um, and, and just you know putting putting worlds together um, really creating that you know really fostering this creativity um, that's a that's a very strong positive I think for for video gaming and you know the way in which we could use video games in, in uh, you know at home and at school and in different settings yeah I, I totally agree I haven't done a lot of reading on the effects of games on learning in, in the classroom. I know it's incredibly popular. And a lot of the people that I've talked to say that it's simply the fact that if you couch something as a game or you put it in the context of a game, then kids are gonna be more interested in the activity, right? Or they're gonna be more interested in the topic. Um, so if you talk to them about, you know, like engineering or city planning and you do it through Minecraft, then, you know, they're gonna be sort of more they're going to pick up what you're putting down more often uh, if it's in the context of something they're familiar with and something they enjoy uh, as well. And then like there's the whole literature on gamification and using and not using really games, but using elements of game design to design educational approaches and work approaches. Right. Um, to make people more motivated, more satisfied, more interested in doing the work. Um, yeah, there's a ton of research on that and, and using gamification in the classroom. And it can be uh, pretty effective, although there it seems to be early on in sort of the life span of that topic and that practice. And so we're we're figuring out a lot of things and figuring out what works and what's unique to games. Right. Um, Jamie, one we both teach at the university level, uh, graduate and undergraduate courses. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's this push to move courses online. When you when you use the term gamification or game design, I'm particularly inter interested in the term game design. Mm -hmm. Would you tell our audience 
what you mean, first of all, what you mean by game design and then how it fits, um, how it applies to education. Sure. So I think in this context, what we're talking about is taking concepts from games and applying them to other activities. So for example, the concept of uh, gaining experience points for performing tasks or going up in levels and unlocking you know, new content. Um, that's a concept that's very familiar in games, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You play through a game, you beat some, you know, you go on a quest and you check off your objectives and you complete all of this and then <clears throat> you get an ability to upgrade something about your character and that unlocks uh, an additional part of the game world that you didn't have access to before. So that's all very you know, if you keep drilling down, there's lots of psychology around things like goal setting and commitments and um, even like social expectations that come into play there. And the same reason that those ideas work in games, the same psychology applies to the educational setting or the work setting. You know, the same reason that wanting to uh, pursue and complete a goal once you've started is the same in video games and and school, you know, and you can sort of leverage those same psychological uh, triggers uh, that work in either context uh, if you're if you're clever about it and if you pay attention to what works. Yeah, and it, it certainly keeps people engaged, and you know, it, it really goes back to you know one of the things that we um, one of the things we know in education, for example, is is progress monitoring it is really effective. And so when you can show on graphs that, you know, a student is making progress and they can see where their goal is and where they are. And if they see they're moving, working towards that um, goal, they're going to be more motivated. And so, yeah, the, the, this idea of gamification really fuels that or really, you know, goes along with that idea that, you know, Hey, if you show people, this is where your next achievement is, or this is where you, you reach the next level, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be able to uh, monitor themselves and see, um, you know, hopefully create more motivation to, to get to that, that spot that next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And game designers have mastered that concept, right? They, they have gotten, they've iterated and they've paid attention to what works and they've gotten very good at figuring out like, how much information can we give at once so that their people aren't overwhelmed and how do we give the right information so that they're motivated and not demotivated or don't adopt a different goal than the one that we want them to have or the one that you know is going to give them the best experience um so yeah there's just a lots everything from just basic you know psychology to uh, user interface design and user experience research uh in video games like they've <laughs> they figured that stuff out uh, and it's a treasure trove for people who are trying to motivate people in, in similar contexts. Uh, That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the motivation problem. You yeah. know, so many kids are motivation is such a problem in education. Um, in the workplace too. Yeah. yeah gaming, gaming could um, game design could help to solve that problem. Well, and, and I think it's fascinating to think about and, and, and I didn't really, Put some of this together until just now in this conversation that you, know, you think about what these designers have ingeniously done it you know you can work you can complete an entire game you know i used to like we used to play right. super mario brothers and you, you complete the game you've pretty much done everything that there is and then you find these little hidden things somewhere like if you go up, up top mm -hmm. and you can find this hidden stuff but now what they do is you can in essence complete the game but when you complete the game, then you have the materials you need to go back and get all the achievements. And so they, they, mm -hmm. they're creating reasons to play through the game multiple times. Okay. Um, you know, rather than going up a level, you play the same. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, you play through it once and then now you've unlocked it so that you can play it with different characters or, right. you know, I think about, you know, the the lego games like lego batman and lego you know star wars and things like that you work through it once in story mode and then you go back in free play and you play the whole thing again but you can get all of these extra um achievements so it, it is pretty ingenious yeah yeah you different learning styles different preferences different uh things that people are coming to that media to want to get out of it um, some of the most successful games are at least able to offer multiple opportunities and, and alternatives, like different ways to play the game or 
different objectives to pursue or uh, additional objectives to pursue, like you said, once the main ones have been satisfied. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, I, one thing I I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on is this idea, um, you know, if, if does video games cause violent behavior, the main, the first question, oftentimes the second question has to do with the effects of video games on the brain, right? They, they, they talk about, you know, does it, does it change your brain? Does it make you think about things differently? Um, and well, there's a, been some research um, sort of similarly uh, concerning research from the perspective of what they really tell but, and versus what the media and other people sort of say that they they tell. Um, yeah. what, are, what are some of your thoughts? What do you say to people when they ask you about the effects of video games actually on the brain? Uh, again, I think the short answer is not much. Um, there, there's been some research on the effects of uh, playing video games on certain cognitive skills and and actual physical changes to the brain. And for example, there's been some research to show that people who play um, like first first person shooters or action games, you know, that are very fast paced and they're having to do a lot of mouse movements to aim at things and um, pay attention to stimuli on the screen and differentiate between what is a low information stimuli and what is like a high threat or high information thing that appears on the screen or or sound that they hear. There's been some research to show that playing those types of games can improve your eyesight, um, that it can improve your ability to divvy up your attention and focus your attention quickly and move it between things. But the effects for those types of things are generally pretty small. They might be you know, clinically or statistically significant, like you can differentiate between people who play the games and don't. Um, but I wouldn't read a whole lot into those types of things. It's not, you know, playing games is not going to make you super intelligent. It's not going to give you 20-20 vision. Um, the effects are generally going to be pretty small. And then the same concept that we came up to came up with before of the, you know, the selection effect, like smart people like to play cognitively demanding games, right? Mm -hmm. You know, smart people like to do crosswords, smart people like riddles. So they're going to be attracted to those sorts of things. So that's one like challenge that researchers have. There, there are methodological ways to get around that, right? And design studies that take that into account. And you do randomized assignments to treatments and so forth. Um, but it is always sort of a caveat, and it's something you should keep in mind as a consumer of research. If you're reading a newspaper article or something on the web and you see that, like, oh, they just did this survey based stuff and they asked people who played a lot of games, you know, uh, and, and had them self select into this research, it's something you might want to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's generally my thoughts and you know there's been research done to show that like playing a lot of games will cause minuscule but detectable like growth in certain parts of the brain right like additional tissue was actually created in one area and maybe lost in another area and they've done the same sort of research in like uh, london taxi drivers right who have to memorize the city of london in order to get their permit to drive a taxi or their license to drive a taxi they have to memorize all this information and they found that the parts of the brain that deal with like spatial orientation uh, and 3D, you know, manipulation of, of objects like physically grows in London taxi cab drivers relative to the general population. And you, know, this, you can sort of see the same thing in people that play a lot of certain types of video games. Right. Um, but what that means in terms of real world differences between people, I I'm not sure. I don't think it amounts to a whole lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it makes me think of things like uh, lumosity. Right. You know, they, they talk about you, know, you do these things and it, you know, the, the, the science of plasticity and it's going to make you, you know, smarter and, you know, use more of your brain and all mm -hmm. of that. And, and what we pretty well know is that your brain gets really good at what you're doing. And so if yeah. you're playing strategy games, you become pretty good at strategy. If you're playing games that rely on memory, your memory, right. you know, strengthens. If you're doing visual, um, first person, you know, first person mm -hmm. shooter, visual processing, yeah. uh, visual decision making, you're going to get better at that. Uh, yeah. Your brain just gets good at what it's doing repeatedly. Yeah, and there's not a whole lot of transfer necessarily right. to That's real right. world tasks. So you do the lumosity or the 
cog jungle or there's like a ton of them out there right that, yeah. mm -hmm. where they have you play these little browser-based games and you may get really good at guiding the little train to the station but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to remember where you put your car keys uh, right you know, right. Next, <laughs> right you know if you do these memory type games you'll get really good at these memory type games but your your memory in real world context and real world usage won't i, I don't i haven't seen any research proving that that transfer happens right 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 yeah it's uh it's interesting and and again kind of going along with some of the some of the challenges and limitations with with some of the research is you know i i saw a study that we talked about this week mm -hmm. uh or we're going to talk about this week where you know the this study was looking at people who played you know 19 hours of video games a week and oh man sign me up <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was like, 19 hours, that's almost a, that's almost a full day of yeah. video gaming. That's a lot of video gaming. So, of course, it's going to have an effect on the brain of some sort. Yeah, yeah doing it for that long. That often is, is going to have some sort of effect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I think that the, the last main area that we wanted to ask you about is, is your thoughts on this this whole notion of addiction, um, you know, we, we have our opinions, but again, would love to hear your thoughts about this whole notion of, you know, people being addicted to video gaming. Yeah, that's the other question that I get a lot in addition to the violence in games. And I mean, you guys know that when psychologists and, and other clinicians use the term addicted, you typically mean something different than what you might see in a headline um, on a news story or what a parent might say about their kid or, or, or something like addicted has a very specific clinical context. And there's like a list of things, right. That a person has to meet at least some of within a certain period of time in order to be considered clinically addicted uh, to a substance or to a behavior. Um, so I think that's sort of the first hurdle that you have to get over. Like when other people in a non-clinical context talk about, you know, look, I'm so addicted to this game, or even like I've seen advertisements for games, right? That say, this is the most addictive game you'll ever play. And I'm like, why, <laughs> like, why would you, why is that a good thing? Like, why would right. you advertise that? But what they mean and then what they want you to think about is that you're going to get really involved in playing this game and you're going to really want to play this game more. And kind of like with, you know, what we were talking about earlier, it comes to whether or not it's interfering with other activities and other areas of your life. It's causing problems with relationships. If you think about it all the time when you're not doing it, um, those are, and in fact, I think the, a lot of those things I just mentioned would map onto like the clinical uh, criteria for diagnosing somebody with addiction. Um, so a lot of times you can look at like gambling addiction, which is the only other like non-substance related addiction mm -hmm. that is that is generally recognized by psychologists. I think it's the only one that's listed in the DSM-5, which is the, diag the help me out, it's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual or... Yeah, mm -hmm. for mental disorders. For mental disorders. It's like the book or probably online these days that psychiatrists... Uh, and other psychologists look at to see like, okay, does this person have a disorder? Right. Um, so it's the only other one, gambling addiction is the only other one that's listed in, in that manual um, currently. Um, everything else is sort of related to substance abuse or some other types of thing. And they have very strict like, okay, here's, I forget how many there are, but there's somewhere like 10 to 12 you know, types of behaviors that a person has to display within a 12 month period in order for them to be considered addicted to gambling. And it's, it's a lot of the same things that we just talked about. Right. And there's a proposal out there to add, um, I forget yeah. what it's called, but it's like basically problematic gaming, mm -hmm. uh, online gaming disorder or something like that. And it's specific to online games for some reason. Um, but it's very similar. It has like this list of things and, and they're pretty high bars, to, to get over in order to be diagnosed as addicted to games. Uh, and you would have to meet like six of them or whatever it is. And that's like in review and it's, it, it may be in a future version of the DSM. Um, but those are the types of, you know, higher bars that 
psychologists tend to talk about where people are being addicted to games. Absent that, I think you're really just talking about somebody who enjoys playing games or enjoys a particular game. And they may be very into a game either when the game is popular and hot, when it first comes out, and, and then they'll beat it and they'll, they'll move on to something else, maybe which they aren't so intensely uh, into, or they may play when they have time. So, you know, if a, a college student is on winter or summer break and she spends 20 hours a week playing, you know, World of Warcraft or League of Legends or, you know, any of these other popular online games, they may be able to do that because they don't have any other responsibilities or they have fewer responsibilities. And, and that's not necessarily a sign of addiction. It's just like, that's what this person wants to do with their spare time. And when other responsibilities resume, you know, school goes back into session or whatever, then they uh, switch off and they're able to deal with that and they play less and they take care of their other responsibilities. So that's sort of an additional complication of seeing whether or not gaming addiction exists or whether a particular person is addicted to a game is like, well, what effect really is it having? And are they able to, you know, the old thing, I can quit anytime I want to, I just don't want to <laughs> because, you know, school isn't back in session yet, or I, you know, got this personal time off or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So that's kind of a roundabout way of saying that gaming addiction is something different between psychologists and everybody else and, and that concept. And most of the time, I think it's just that somebody is really engaged with a game and uh, into a game and it doesn't lot rise to the level of true addiction. Mm -hmm. Right. What do you guys think as, as clinicians? Does that match your, your experience or, or things that you've heard from other people? Yeah, it matches mine. Um, you know, because we deal with it on a regular basis, uh, cell phone addiction and video game addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are, we do probably have some patients who may be addicted uh, because they do meet all those criteria. Uh, they miss it if it's not there, and that sort of stuff. But the overwhelming number of kids that we see and families, mm -hmm. they just enjoy it. Yeah. And, it's, and, and it's just managing it. You said that almost at the beginning of this interview, you talked about time management. And that's really what the issue is more than anything else. It's right. time management. Yeah, it, it's time management and it's maybe making something more more meaningful or productive out of the experience. Like right. I play games with my kids, right? So my sure. my yeah. daughter, my 13 year old daughter is super into a game called Overwatch now, which is a first person online competitive game. Um, and like she will play that more than it would probably be reasonable. Like if we let her, uh, especially during the summer when she doesn't have school and other activities, but I'll hop on there. You know, I've got a, a separate computer. I'll hop on there and I'll play with her for an hour or two and sort of make, you know, an experience that we have together. So it's not just wasting time or, or I don't think it's wasting time anyway, because you're doing something you enjoy, but uh, it is making it more meaningful. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, we look for, we use the word addiction so loosely now that it really, you know, devalues what we're really talking about when we're talking about an addiction. And, and yeah, I think, you know, just because somebody would do something, uh, engage in any activity, whenever they had the opportunity to engage in, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an addiction. I mean, you know, right. most of these, I, I, it's so challenging when a parent comes in and says that their child is addicted to video games and they say they'll play it, you know, 24 hours a day if I let them, but yet, you know, they're getting decent grades in school and they're going to school every day and they're meeting Thanks all these other, so. but yet, you know, he would play the video games anytime he had the opportunity. Well, sure, but he's meeting all these other criteria uh, or all these other obligations. Mm -hmm. There's no criteria for a, a, a true addiction uh, present. And, yeah. and, and parents really have a hard time understanding that. Right. So Yeah, I'm kind of surprised still that there are parents like that, because at this point, you know, like I'm, I'm part of the generation that grew up with video games, right? right? Like, I remember having them from the time I was, I was young. I don't remember a time before video games. I remember a time before the internet. I remember a time before cable television, but sort of video games was always there uh, with me. And a lot of my peers, you know, who have kids my age are, are the same way. Mm -hmm. And games are so much more pervasive, um, whether it's 
playing games on a computer or a console or a, a cell phone, you know, like everybody has games in their pocket, probably, right? Everybody right. has Candy Crush or something similar installed on their phone. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not go. Yeah, yeah, or a, a lot of people do. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. kind of surprised uh, every time I hear that, where somebody who's just so unfamiliar with the concept of games that has kids that age, it's like, well, they're all around you, and, and you could pick one up pretty easily and, and see what it's all about. You can get them for free on your phone, or I'm sure your kid has a stack of them. <laughs> right. If they're, if they're into gaming as much as you say they are, uh, maybe some of them they would rather you not play <laughs> to find out what type of games they're playing. But maybe right. you should. Given that. Don't, don't let be be very cautious if if you're trying to have an open mind. Be very cautious to pick up before picking up uh, Grand Theft Auto Five as your first one that you're going to see. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we need to have a training session That's for right. parents. Uh, let's start with Mario Brothers or, well, or something. Or Minecraft. Or, yeah, or Minecraft. Something. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, absolutely. So, um, well, so you know, anything else, anything else that you, you'd like to share? I know that we kind of covered a lot of different area here today, but anything else that you'd like to share? Um, you know, where can people follow you, get more information about uh, all of this? Um, anything else you'd like to share? Uh, just that I, I think it's a really cool time to be into psychology and video games. There's a lot of really interesting research. Um, like I said, the generation of people who grew up with video games are more and more getting into the point where they're able to study them. Like that's their career. They're able to mm -hmm. choose to do that kind of research. They're able to drive research agendas for programs and departments. They're able to uh, allocate funding towards that type of stuff. So there's sort of this explosion of research about psychology and video games. And it goes hand in hand with um, research on online behaviors and cell phones and all that type of stuff, because a lot of the same questions can apply right, right. Uh, to both video games and those other technologies. Um, so it's really cool to see all this, this stuff happening. And it's really interesting to see game developers um, taking those lessons and applying them to act the actual creation of games and development of games that are fun and engaging and provide positive social experiences and interactions with other players. Like there's a lot of really smart game developers out there who are paying attention to this sort of stuff and um, even have psychologists working in-house uh, in game development companies and game publishers and community management roles um, where they're, they're helping make better games and better experiences for gamers and better communities. Absolutely. Um, so it's really cool to see that. As far as where to find out more about all that, you can go over to psychologyofgames.com, which is the main clearinghouse for all the stuff that I write and talk about. I have a podcast um, that I regularly update uh, where I will interview like a researcher or a game designer or some other type of expert on the psychology of video games about a specific topic. Um, so there's there's episodes on violence in games, and I've got one that I'm going to be recording soon about addiction in games. Uh, and a bunch of other different types of topics and psychology of games. There'll be links to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Patreon and, and all that sort of stuff as well. Awesome. So there's, right. there's also the book. <laughs> Getting the book. I was just going to mention that. Yep. Uh, it's called Getting Gamers by Jamie Madigan. Look for it on Amazon or wherever you like, and I'm sure you could find it. And there's, um, it goes into way more res uh, research research, and detail than I typically get into in like a blog post, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So there's lots of citations and discussion of particular studies and the place that all this has in the larger context of psychology. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, well, I'll put a link to all of that in the in the show notes to your to your website and, and a, a link to um, to your book. But like you said, it, certainly the link to all of your other social media and, and podcasts. Um, are, are there too. So fantastic. Yep. Awesome. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for yeah. taking time out of your Sunday morning to, to talk with Absolutely. us um, about video games. Um, I, I always look for opportunities to talk about video games. Uh, you, you missed a comment that Richard made on the slide <laughs> just a few minutes ago when you said um, that you can remember a time before the internet, but not really a time before video games. He said he remembers a time before TV. Yeah, and I, I don't go quite that far back, but 
I remember black and white TV vaguely, if that helps. <laughs> I remember before black and white TV. <laughs> I remember when I had to be the remote control because there wasn't a, there wasn't a clicker. <laughs> right. And I had to go push the button. Back but and forth. That's right. That's right. So, uh, but that's everything is relative and everything is new. Yep. <laughs> that's right. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, but again, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, anytime you ever want to come back on and, and talk about anything, uh, or if you have a new book or anything. With that new addiction. You know, Jamie, you mentioned that you're going to do a podcast on addiction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't mind talking to you again about that. Yes. Or, or you know, we could expand that a little bit because that's the clinical interest that most of our patients have is addiction, this issue yeah. of addiction. Okay. So, so I wouldn't mind that. talking to you additionally about that. I'll make a note. I'll uh, follow up with you about that. Okay. Thanks for the offer. Sounds great. Yep. Fantastic. Well, well, thanks again so much, and uh, we'll be in touch and talk again. All right. This was fun. It's always good to talk shop. Yeah, okay. great. Thank thanks, you. Jamie. All right. Bye-bye.